and we are back on the build phase. I'm Mr. Ben, and today spring has sprung. So I got open windows here at the build phase compound, and there may be some bird chirping noises that my mic picks up. If so, I apologize, but it's too nice to have fresh air in the house. I can't shut the windows. So today I'm gonna talk about Mortal Kombat, and specifically we have five more rounds of the combat countdown to get to. So we're gonna start with the post that was made on April 5th. So this was last week, but it was after I recorded my episode and we're gonna go all the way through up until the most recent cards posted in the combat countdown. Now I am aware of the YouTube video hype reel that Upper Deck has created for this expansion and wow, it is unlisted on YouTube at this time, but if you have the link, you can watch it, as well as the person who I think maybe is the creator has it listed on their YouTube channel. But I'm gonna talk about the cards, the video, all that in a separate episode. Today, I'm just gonna focus on the five rounds of combat countdown that have taken place over the last week, and we're gonna start by diving into hey now. Kano is a five cost nether realm affiliated 12 6 1 with range. I say nether realm because in that video that I just mentioned, they say earth realm versus nether realm. So I believe that's what his affiliation is going to be called, but it's the MK letters as opposed to the Mortal Kombat Dragon logo. He has the ability, a complete lack of morals. During each enemy player's build phase, there is supposed to be the inclusion of the word they here. It should read, during each enemy player's build phase, they may pay Kano five recruit points if they do move him to their side. If you look at the actual card, the word they doesn't appear. This is not the first typo we've seen on a versus card. These things happen. I, I don't want to get too hung up on that detail. But looking at this character, so five cost, 12 attack. That's very, very good. I don't care about the range. In fact, I would almost rather he didn't have range because you're never going to want to put this guy in the back row and try to get a value trade where you're able to pick somebody off and not get hit back. I think you always, always want this five drop to get killed when he attacks because the idea that you're, what are you going to do? Put him in the front row and then your opponent moves your blocker out of the way so they have unprotected access to your back row. I just can't see a scenario where I put this guy into play and then I allow my opponent to have the opportunity to recruit him. Now, maybe they won't. And if you're going second, maybe your opponent doesn't want to. You play Kano on your turn five, pass to them. Now they have six recruit points. Are they gonna spend their turn to steal your five drop? Well, maybe, because you're not just getting the value of the five drop, you're KOing your opponent's probably best dude. If it's turn five and I played Kano on my turn five and on your turn six, you're getting a character. You're not sacrificing any hand advantage to get it. And you're basically killing my best dude. So I don't think you ever give an, an opponent the opportunity to use a complete lack of morals if you can avoid it. It would be Something has to have gone wrong in order for my opponent to have the opportunity to bribe Kano away from me. So that's a lot of words to talk about the keyword that I don't think you will ever allow your opponent. Nobody is ever going to let anybody use a complete lack of morals. This is just not going to happen. What is going to happen is you're going to play this guy on five. He's going to attack with the attack value of a seven drop, and you're gonna make sure he sends that attack into somebody who has at least six so he can get stunned back. And that's pretty much every use case for this character, I think. Next, we have Sonya Blade. Now, can I take a second to just comment on how awesome these combat countdown pairings have been? I know I mentioned this a little bit in the previous episode, but if you're a fan of Mortal Kombat, Putting and Sonya and Kano together, like th these pairings are clearly made by somebody who understands the lore and is choosing characters that should be paired together. And I, I really have an appreciation for that. Another sub comment, we yet again have a pairing where one character, Sonya, is shooting her ring move out of her hands, really dynamic, really active, and Kano is just kind of smirking. What? What is with? <laughs> One card art being awesome and the other one being kind of like, eh, in all these combat countdown pairings. I feel like that's intentional too. Okay, 
So what does Sonya do? First of all, she is Earth Realm affiliated, so it is the Mortal Kombat Dragon logo as opposed to the MK letter logo. She is a 581 with range, and she's a special forces commander superpower. It is a main phase, pay a yellow, choose another character on your side to get stealth or sniper this turn. Uh, that's very good. The so not only does it let you get past whatever your opponent has in the front row, you can do so potentially safely. You could tuck Sonya in the back row. Pay, now with a 5-8 stat block, she's probably not gonna get hit back all the time anyway. And so I maybe would like to see her be a little more heavily weighted into the attack because she's, her superpower is very much an attack superpower, but her stat line is a little bit more defensive. However, you don't have to use Special Forces Commander on herself. You could use this on another character, and it's going to let you avoid whatever their blockers are and either melee into the, the target that you need to hit in the back row, the main character, say, or even better, range attack into that target in the back row and maybe not even get clipped back and get a value trade out of it. Overall, this feels pretty okay. If you don't have the yellows and she's just 5-8 range on turn 5, that feels a little weak, so I don't think you're going to just throw her in a deck as a potential team attacker. I do think you're going to put her, in, you're going to want to put her into a deck that both has access to yellows and also doesn't have a main character who's so dependent upon yellow. Like, you have to have a few to spare. This feels to me like kind of a support power that fills in maybe a, a deck that lacks a lot of flight you could throw her in knowing that you've got an extra yellow or two over the course of the game to maybe get around that problematic front row both of these cards feel fairly playable Kano sort of thematically appropriately is more brute force where Sonya has the ability to kind of sneak through things use her special forces training to kind of get past the enemy front line I like the flavor on both of these Honestly, the card art on both of these is fine. If there was going to be somebody who was going to have kind of a static, non-dynamic pose, but have this, like, absolute smug grin on his face, like, the, the art selection is appropriate for Kano, of course. Uh, the complete lack of morals is a pretty annoying drawback, but I don't think it's one that's ever actually going to come into play. All right, moving on to the April 6th part of the combat countdown, we once again have a truly excellent matchup between Cyrax and Sector. And this time, the card art part is pretty even, honestly. Looking at Cyrax first, he is a two cost, Earthrealm affiliated, flight range three, two, one. Now, I did not expect to see a lot of flight in the Mortal Kombat box. Um, even characters that have the ability to lift up into the air within when you're playing Mortal Kombat, it tends to be pretty limited due to the type of game that it is. But I suppose if you've got a jetpack to lift a little bit off the ground, you could lift more. So, okay, I'm okay with Cyrax having flight. The interesting part of this card, the 3-2-1 is pretty forgettable as a stat block for a two cost. It's, it's almost perfectly average. Energy net, main phase, pay a blue, days a face up enemy supporting character. It can't recover on its next turn. Wow. Now, we saw something very similar to this in the Illustrated Universe years ago in the form of, oh gosh, what was that guy's name? Paladin, I think. He was a hammer-affiliated, I think, three-drop who could pay a blue, and if he stunned a guy, it would freeze the character for the next turn. It would prevent recovery. We've also seen this type of effect in the form of the Net Launcher from the Predator expansion. And... Of course, sort of the classic freeze effect. Now, this is a little more severe than just a freeze, uh, the cla but it, it has that kind of same effect as well. The classic freeze effect is, of course, Iceman. So this is good. Now, how many games are you going to have him on two and have the blue on two to deal with this? I don't know, but I don't think that's really the important part. At two cost, this guy is an excellent tech card. You're for sure going to be able to tuck him into later turns, weave him into a turn five under drop alongside a three drop potentially, or, or even later. And if as long as your main character has the attack value to stun whatever they're trying to protect in the back row, this guy can just clear a blocker out of the way. And then you still have him potentially as like a team attacker. It, I think this power is quite good. I think the energy net is gonna be really annoying and 
especially because it doesn't require any really anything from you. All you do is pay for it and pick an enemy supporting character and then you flip them down. This can get rid of stacks of counters. This can get rid of equipment. And most importantly, it means your opponent doesn't have probably whatever their best dude is. They don't have that unit for the next turn because it's still face down. It's prevented from recovering. That's a very strong power. And on a character as cheap as two, I think weaving him into later turns as a tech choice is going to be very, very viable. Next, we have Sector. He is a two cost, Nether Realm affiliated, flight range three, two, one. So there's a lot of symmetry between these cards in quite a few ways. He has homing missile, main phase, pay a blue, symmetry continues. Choose an enemy player, then you secretly choose a character on their side. Then they guess which character you chose. If they were wrong, wound the chosen character. So first off, this power does nothing if your opponent only has one character in play. It just doesn't work. Because of course, the, you can only choose the one, they're gonna know, they have to get it wrong. So they need to have at least two characters in play in order to even have a hope of hitting with this homing missile. The kind of mind game that this plays on you is whatever the optimal place for the missile to hit is, your opponent is not going to, like that's not what you wanna pick because then your opponent's going to automatically know you picked the optimal target for the missile. And then they'll pick that and then it doesn't hit anything. So as the sector player, you have this incentive to maybe go after a suboptimal target. Maybe instead of trying to wound the main character, you wound a supporting character. But the sector, the player targeted by sector knows that the sector player has to be thinking these kind of things. So there's a, there's a real mind game here of do you choose the best play or do you know that they know that that's the best play. So you choose the second best play because they're trying to choose the second best play to make you guess the, I think it's really cool. I think in a tournament setting, this might be a little too unwieldy. This might be a little too unreliable. If I'm playing for real stakes and I have a limited number of locations in my deck, and I'm only gonna be able to use so many superpowers, do I want to run the risk that I activate a superpower and end up with nothing? That, but then again, the upside is you just drop a wound on a character. This could straight up KO somebody. This gets around all kinds of things because there's no combat interaction there. They can't plot twist out of it. They can, basically any kind of combat interaction is avoided by this and you just get to throw a wound. Plus if the wound lands, you could still potentially attack that character again in the same turn and get multiple wounds on a main character all in one turn. How often is that gonna happen? Oh, it's gonna be dependent on who you're playing against and the situation. I'm just not sure that homing missile, the more players, the more characters an enemy player has, the better chance your homing missile has of finding its target. But if that's the kind of board state where your opponent has a lot of presence on the board, well, what does your board look like? Are you, do you need to be losing the game in order for this power to be consistent? I don't know if I feel very good about that. That said, he's a two cost character, so maybe you can throw him in, kind of like what I, I said with his Earthrealm counterpart, Cyrax. Maybe you can kind of get him in as an underdrop in later turns to clear something out of the way. I think between the two of these, if what you want is a turn seven underdrop that can get your opponent's best blocker out of the way, I feel like Cyrax is just the better choice kind of all around. But man, I, I want to like Homing Missile, but I just feel like it's gonna be inconsistent. I will be happily proven wrong if once we get these cards in hand, it ends up landing. If you're able to actually win that mind game more often than not, then I will definitely, I will eat a little crow on that and I will say Sector is better than I initially thought. But my feeling today is that that homing missile is going to fail to find a target in some significant number of games. All right, April 7th combat countdown. We have plot twists. So this is a little different than seeing characters go versus each other, uh, but it is flawless victory and finish him, which are both pretty important terms within the Mortal Kombat universe. I feel like, I feel like we've seen finish him before. I think maybe this was one of the oversized cards for the midwinter event. 
Uh, but we'll, we're going to go through both of these regardless. Flawless victory. Uh, any combat, choose an unwounded character on your side in the combat. It can't be struck this combat. So this is basically in good hands, but it works both while attacking and defending. Right? I think in good hands has to be a defender that can't be struck. I might be remembering that card wrong. Doesn't matter. This is very strong. This card's going to see play. Anytime you're on the Earth Realm affiliation, having the ability to just prevent an attack from going through. Now, it does specify an unwounded character, so it's going to be unlikely that this is going to keep too many wounds off your main character unless you draw it early in the game. Potentially, you could use this to deny some early game wounds. But once you're looking at turns three, four, five, it'd be you don't need this card. If your main character is still unwounded on turn five, chances are you're winning the game pretty handedly already. And this is just a win more card. I think that is probably not the primary place where you're going to be using this though. This is going to be a card that you put into a deck where you have a lot of one health characters, lot of one health supporting characters, and you use this to essentially say, give target supporting character plus one health. Like, give a friendly character plus one health. That's kind of how this plot twist works. And I feel like that's often going to be good. I, uh, now, obviously, you don't use this to preserve the life of like a one or a two drop. Most of the time, you're probably going to want to save these back to be able to preserve the health of your six, seven drops, your bigger dudes. But it, you don't have to have it that way. So th this does give you kind of an interesting difference in application depending upon whether you draw it early game or late game early game this seems like hey i'm going to keep a wound off my main character which often is a good thing to think about your plot twists like one of the reasons shock to the system has always been so popular is because it's a card that just says don't take a wound and a lot of times not taking wounds is the biggest priority for the main character it does depend a little bit on your strategy there are certainly times where you'd rather have your main character eat a wound than a really important combo piece supporting character. But generally speaking, you lose the game when you get too many wounds on your MC. So drawing this early and using it to prevent an early wound on your main character feels totally fine. And then late game, when maybe your main character is already kind of beat up and like hiding in the back row, you can use this to preserve your protectors or some important combo piece. I think this is a very solid plot twist. Finish him, KO a wounded enemy supporting character. Uh, we've seen, oh, it's dual affiliated. Interesting. So both Outworld and Nether Realm. What was the affiliation on the other one? Just Earth Realm. Okay. Uh, we've seen cards like this before. Uh, and Stay Down, I think, was the one that came out in the New Mutants. And they seem so juicy. They really do. They, they are so tempting. But when the rubber meets the road, this requires your opponent to play supporting characters that have multiple health. And it requires you to at least commit an attack into getting that character to have its first wound. So you could kind of think about this plot twist as a combat plot twist that says this character, uh, target character on your side has lethal this turn. That's sort of where this is gonna fall. And uh, if your opponent has a whole bunch of cards that are supporting characters that are one health in their deck, this is a totally dead card. This just rots in your hand and you can't do anything with it. So I think this card is going to be very meta dependent. If there is some defining supporting character that's really tough to deal with that has multiple health in a particular format, that would be the place where this plot twist could maybe see some play. Outside of that, I have a hard time including these types of effects in my deck. Anything that's useless, if my opponent doesn't play into it, I'm a little more reluctant and to put into my deck and finish him definitely could end up being completely useless again a little bit dependent on the format and the meta that you're playing in. if there's a lot of multi-health characters so life's too short as a format obviously this card is complete trash but that's one format so i understand that's not all formats but there are certainly going to be situations that aren't as extreme as the life's too short format where the meta just shapes up and everybody's dependent on single health characters and this card can't be played. I think Flawless Victory, on the other hand, is likely going to see more overall play, although it is a little bit more limited in that it can only be used by Earthrealm characters, whereas Finish Him can be used by everything in the box. So both these plot twists have some utility to be sure, 
but I think Flawless Victory is going to be the more flexible, likely seen more play than finish him overall, except in the metas where there's lots and lots of multi-health characters, then I might adjust that a little bit. All right, moving on to the April 10th round of the Combat Countdown. We are looking at Liu Kang and, oh man, how do I pronounce it? Is it Jairus or Garrus? I think it's Jairus. It's been a minute since I played Mortal Kombat 11, so I apologize to all of the Jairus fans if I am mispronouncing his name. Liu Kang, another one of the just absolute most iconic characters in the Mortal Kombat lore. Uh, this particular version of him is a 7-cost Earthrealm affiliated 3-14-1 with range. So in the card art, he is summoning his fireball on his hand, and Liu Kang can shoot fireballs, as well as he can propel himself pretty well through the air. So I guess that's why they justify giving him range, but I, I gotta say, the range is a little weird on this guy. Uh, bicycle kick, Liu Kang strikes any number of times while in melee combat. So he's not a 314, he is a infinity 14. That's crazy. Grand Champion of Mortal Kombat. Liu Kang can't be stunned while in solo combat. Oh my goodness. Now this is a seven drop I can get behind. Holy smokes. So he functionally can attack for infinity attack. He can do it at range, which means you could probably get value trades in places, although I'm a little surprised to see how many, there's more ranged characters in this box already than I was expecting. So he might not be as safe at range, but still. 14 defense is no joke, but most importantly, as long as he's attacking by himself, it doesn't matter what your opponent's attack value is. And if your opponent has to attack into him, they need to be able to put together a team attack or they can't deal with him at all. This is wild. This, holy smokes. Uh, yeah, this guy's really good. And I'm particularly happy to see the bicycle kick make an appearance in the game. Uh, I was hoping it was going to be a superpower on main character Liu Kang, but making it strikes any number of times while in melee combat is pretty good too. Especially when you think about how the bicycle kick is like within the game of Mortal Kombat. The da -da 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 of it. I like it a lot. Okay, yeah, I'm a fan. I like the seven drop. I like the seven drop a great deal. Man, so the guy's basically, as long as he's in melee combat, he's an infinity 14 who can't be stunned. Wow. I guess I should specify melee solo combat. So there are ways to get around him. If your opponent can team attack, uh, that will, they, they still have to get to 14. Uh, if they ranged attack, oh yeah, I think I said that he could, he could safely attack from the back row for infinity and that's wrong. He has to be in melee. So you got to put him up front, but I don't think you feel bad about putting a guy with 14 defense up front. Uh, man. Yeah. Okay. I'm with this. I'm definitely with this. And this is exactly the kind of card that you would use Flawless Victory on. So late game, you play this seven drop. He's in the front row. He, he demands a team attack. Hold on. Let me make sure this combo works. Yeah. So he has to be unwounded because if he has even one wound, he'd be dead. And then he can't be struck. So he can't be struck solo. Let's say my opponent has three characters in play, right? They declare a team attack into Liu Kang, and I flawless victory it. So now I get to kill one of their dudes, maybe. Let, let's assume they attacked melee, because my guy's in the front row and they had to, say. That, although that would suck. I think what you want to deal with this dude is ranged team attackers, not melee. Uh, so they lose a guy. I play flawless victory. Liu Kang's still standing. Now they only have one character left on their side. They can't deal with Liu Kang past turn. That feels really good. Wow. Wow, this guy seems strong. Wow. Okay, six cost Jairus. He's Nether Realm affiliated. He's a 661. That feels a little weak, but let's see what he does. Immortal. When Jairus gets KO'd, shuffle him into his owner's deck. Okay, so I don't know how much I care about that, but let's let's keep going. I am a fixed point in time. When Jairus appears, put a vitality counter on him for each Jairus who has been KO'd on your side this game. Rewind time. Reaction. Pay yellow. When Jairus gets KO'd, put him onto his owner's side. Okay. Um, I feel like Immortal is on here just for flavor text reasons. I, I don't think I actually care 
like he's a six drop. So you shuffle him back into your deck, and then what? You draw him again on turn seven. Like, how many copies of this guy are you going to run? He's a six drop. This, would, this is going to rot in your hand for the first five turns of the game. So I don't know if you want to go four up on him. And if you're not running multiples of him, like if you can't recruit him multiple times, I am a fixed point in time is totally irrelevant. Uh, the first time you recruit him, it does nothing. The second time he he get, he becomes a six six two. So you're looking at turn seven if you're recruiting him. Assuming we don't have any ramp effects, you recruit him on turn six. Then on turn seven, you recruit him again, and you get a six six two for your seven drop when you could be running an infinity fourteen with range. Uh, that doesn't seem very good. Now the the part of the card that I think actually does seem pretty good is rewind time reaction pay yellow when he gets ko'd put him onto his owner's side so forcing your opponent to have to get through the same body multiple times that feels like the most relevant thing but man so you got to have a deck that has the yellows for it uh my assumption is so he gets ko'd which means he's removed from play and you react to that with a yellow, and he goes back into play. I think that means he counts as a new character. So you would, if I had multiple yellows and you had multiple attackers, you could stun Jairus multiple times, and I could keep resurrecting him with rewind time each time, I think. I'm out, I, I will need to double check that to make sure I'm understanding that rule correctly, but I'm pretty sure. Oh, and okay, I am a fixed point in time will actually also work with rewind time, I'm pretty sure. Because he gets KO'd, so he's removed from play. You pay the yellow to bring him back. He's a 6-6-2. My opponent attacks him two more times. He dies again. I play the, pay the yellow to bring him back. Now he's appearing again, so he's become a 6-6-3. Yeah, I could see that being annoying, but at 6-6 six, six on turn 6, like these stats are going to be totally irrelevant. They're almost irrelevant on turn 6. I mean, just within the same show, we looked at a 5-drop who eats this guy alive. Um, I guess he's going to be most relevant if your opponent has no stealth or sniper or flight. If they have to deal with him honestly, this could be really annoying because they're always going to have to have another like four drop size character that they can throw into this dude to get him out of the way to be able to access the rest of their board. So I could see him being pretty stubborn but that's going to require kind of a lot. You're going to need the yellows. You're going to have to... Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I'm a little bit out on Jairus. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. But I I think he's... I think his stats needed to be bigger to make him an actual threat. Or rewind time needed to be like a key... Like the fact that this requires a superpower, like a location payment, I think is going to push him outside of the realm of playability, in my opinion. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. Yesterday's combat countdown is Jax versus Devora, And I think this photo of Jax is actually young Jax that, with, I guess, spoilers for Mortal Kombat 11, uh, there's some time travel elements to it. And I'm pretty sure this is young Jax that was time traveled from... The era of gosh was it mortal kombat 3 i don't know i i like mortal kombat but i'm not the biggest lord nerd so feel free to correct me <laughs> uh he has a two cost earth realm affiliated 242 with range just based on those stats the the attack is a little bit weak but four defense on turn two with two health this guy's going to be sticky and annoying he is tough so when he gets stunned you can recover him this is oh did it always say he, he still gets wounded? Was that part of the original tough text? Probably wasn't, I just don't remember. So he could be kind of annoying to deal with, particularly early in the game. Four defense on turn two isn't crazy, but it is a number that a significant percentage of characters aren't gonna be able to deal with. A significant percentage of main characters aren't gonna be able to deal with. So if you get up to that four, you stun him once, and I go, oh, well, he's gonna to tough it out. Maybe you can't send that second attack through. Maybe you can't get to the things he was protecting in my back row. I also like that his next to power, Bionic Arms, combat, pay a green. If Jax is in melee combat, he gets plus four, plus four, this combat. So potentially he could become a six, eight out of nowhere. 
And you always have to think about that. Or your opponent, if you're the person playing Jax, your opponent's going to have to think about that. Oh, should I commit the team attack here in case they pay the green? But then I'll have one less attack. This seems pretty good for a two drop. Oh, I like most of what this guy's doing. I don't think this is going to revolutionize the two drop slot. But if you're on Earthrealm and you have the kind of main character that maybe needs a little bit of protection early in the game, this guy fits that role very, very well. Devora. Uh, I will say on the card art for both of these guys, it's fine. It's it's a little passive. Jax is flexing and kind of looking looking a little smug. Devora is also kind of flexing, but in her creepy insect way. It's fine. Devora is a three cost, Nether Realm affiliated, two, four, one. Insect swarm. Enemy characters lose and can't gain range. Now that power I like. That's cool. And Mother Bug. Any combat, pay a yellow. When Devora gets KO'd this turn, put one third, put a one third, De oh no, sorry, <laughs> that's the stats. A one three Devora supporting character token onto your side with flight and one health. <laughs> so she turns into her insect form. That is awesome. I, that is awesome. Um, How good is that going to be? A three cost. So the tech utility here where you just deny your opponent the ability to make ranged attacks i mean there's certain main characters you get this character down and protect it you're going to lock certain main characters out of ever leveling up main characters that require ranged attacks in order to or range stuns or or that that key off of range in some capacity this could potentially lock those main characters out of ever leveling how many of them are there going to be in this box? That I'm not sure. How many of them are there going to be in the meta or the format where you're building your deck? That kind of, it, the stock will rise and fall for Insect Swarm depending upon how rotten the format is with range. But overall, in a vacuum, I really like that power. I think that's really strong. The Mother Bug power, maybe that's a little bit less important as winning games as far as a powerful game mechanic it is not a powerful game mechanic you are essentially paying a yellow to generate a one drop at the cost of your three drop so your three drop gets killed and you get to trade them in plus another card for a one three flyer with one health there are certainly going to be games where having that extra one three sure your opponent can kill it right away but it means they couldn't put a wound on your main character there's certainly going to be games where that's really relevant but it feels a little expensive to me to have to invest a whole second card. I almost wish that that was just like that she had worse base stats and that this was just, a, again, I, I don't know if this rises to the level. I kind of said this with, uh, who was it? Somebody else with Jairus as well. I don't know if this rises to the level of justifying a superpower, having to put a whole second card into this effect. Like if there was a, if there was a plot twist that said, like discard this to generate a one three flyer with one health. I don't know if I'd run that in my deck. So certainly there would be decks where that would be good as a plot twist because it's not costing you any recruit points, but this is, so this is a little bit different in that you've already invested the three recruit points. Now you have to invest another card to get essentially a one drop. Like if this card said, turn one of the cards in your hand into a token, I don't know. I, I really want to love it because I love the theme. I, I do really like the theme and I like the insect swarm keyword a great deal. But overall, I feel like that mother bug superpower probably isn't going to be worth activating most, most of the time. Mm, I don't know. I feel like I'm being a little bit mealy mouthed on some of these calls because it's like there are edge cases where I definitely think it could be good, but overall, not, I don't know. I'm not convinced, I'm not convinced that that mother bug is actually going to be a thing you want to do in any kind of high stakes game at the kitchen table, hundred percent kitchen table. The flavor is off the charts. I love it for that, but competitive, I'm just, I'm not convinced before I go back and give a final thumbs up, thumbs down to all these cards. I just want to take a second to shout out my patrons. Uh, everyone at the Promat Eclipse level and above, Brad, Jason, Justin, Patrick, Patrick, Peter, and Roland, as well as the rest of the patrons. These folks all help keep the lights on around here, and we love every one of you. If you like what we're doing here, you can join us at patreon.com slash the build phase and get into the coolest clubhouse in Versus. Going back to Kano and Sonya Blade, I think both of these get a thumbs up. 
Sonya's maybe a thumbs medium. Maybe. I don't like her for the 581 stat line, but that superpower feels like it could be really impactful. Kano seems great. You just you always want to make sure he gets stunned when you put that 12 attack to use. Cyrax is a massive thumbs up. I think this guy's going to be a great tech card. And I think Sector, again, I'm going to have to drop him into the thumbs medium. I'm just not convinced homing missile is going to find its target more often than not. Uh, these plot twists, big thumbs up for flawless victory. And I think I got to do thumbs down on finish him. While I do acknowledge there could be formats or game states where this card could look pretty good, I think the majority of the time it's going to rot in your hand. And in my opinion, I don't want plot twists that rot in my hand. Liu Kang, again, big, big thumbs up. And Jairus, I'm going to have to go thumbs medium on this guy. I just... It, I almost want to say thumbs down, to be honest. I, I think he's asking a little too much from you. And the if he was like a three drop with all the same stuff, that changes everything. Because then you can actually recruit this guy multiple times. I'm not sure how many times you're actually going to be able to make Jairus appear in a game. And if he only appears once or twice, then I feel pretty safe saying that he's not good enough. Uh, finally, our final combat countdown for the day, we have Jax. I'm going to give him a thumbs up, and I'm going to give Devora a thumbs up as well. While I did kind of attack the Mother Bug superpower as maybe not being competitively viable, the theme is off the charts for this, and as much as I'd spend my time focused on a lot of the competitive applications of these cards, I play most of my games at the kitchen table. So I do love casual play, even though I generally try to think about the game in a competitive way. So overall, this is another just string of great Mortal Kombat characters. I could not be more thrilled for this box, and I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on it. I will be doing some content with regard to the card reveals that took place in that Mortal Kombat video, but I think I'm going to give that its own airing. So until next time, I'm Mr. Ben, and you should go win some games.